Amen. Well, congratulations. You made it to message number 11 in the King Convert series. I hope you've enjoyed getting to know our King Convert, Brother Paul. He started out as Saul, but was converted by Christ to Paul. It's a man who was dedicated to killing Christians, literally tearing down the church, and then he was converted and made a 180 degree change. And, and I, I love it, I'm gonna miss it because it's not gonna be here, point at you, give you this thing. But it's that, it's that he started out tearing down the cross, pushing down the church. And then after his conversion, we find him with equal vigor, trying to pull up the cross, trying to pull up the church. And that's the Paul that we have studied all these weeks. I thank uh, Mike Shocker for the excellent banner that went up. I hope it has been something that has engaged you, has been something that you can look at and stay on track with all the series going through. But alas, another series will begin next week, and so the King Convert will be gone. Last week we left Paul and his 276 shipmates who were bound for Rome but suddenly were caught in a hurricane. It was a storm that blew them 500 miles off their course for 14 days, only to crash into a sandbar that miraculously made it on shore on an island that they didn't know where it was cold and rainy. When we get to that part of the text, I want you to think about it's not so bad if it's cold. And it's really not so bad if it's raining. But when it's cold and raining, I wonder if Paul at that moment felt like much of a conqueror. Probably not. But that will not change our point. And this is the last time I will ask you to do the little Paul rhyme time with me. Uh, you can see the point up top or on your outline. I'll read the uh, not cap stuff. You read the cap stuff. If God can conquer the world through Paul, He can conquer through us all. Amen. Now, if you want to open it up to Acts, the last chapter, orienting you, all of you have been here through much of this series, Acts is uh, after the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, then Acts of the Apostles. We're in Acts chapter 28, the last chapter in this blessed book. Did you make it there? We're going to read High Adventure on the island of Malta, Acts chapter 28, verses 1 through 10. Please follow along as I read. Once safely on shore, we found the island was called Malta. The islanders showed us unusual kindness. They built a fire and welcomed us all because it was raining and cold. Paul gathered a pile of brushwood, and as he put on the fire, a viper, driven out by the heat, fastened itself on his hand. When the islanders saw the snake hanging from his hand, they said to each other, This man must be a murderer, for though he escaped from the sea, justice had not allowed him to live. But Paul shook the snake off into the fire and suffered no ill effects. The people expected him to swell up. Or suddenly Paul dead, but after waiting a long time and seeing nothing unusual happen to him, they changed their minds and said he was God. There was an estate nearby that belonged to Publius, the chief official of the island. He welcomed us to his home and for three days entertained us hospitably. His father was sick in bed, suffering from fever and dysentery. Paul went in to see him, and after prayer, placed his hands on him and healed him. When this had happened, the rest of the sick on the island came and were cured. They honored us in many ways, and when we were ready to sail, they furnished us with supplies, with the supplies we needed. That got a lot of fill in blanks for you this time around, folks. God can turn a disaster into a delight when we seek to serve. God can turn a disaster into a delight when we seek to serve. Now, there is really an entire sermon 
just in this text alone. And maybe someday we will come back to Malta in the text. Actually, man, I want to go to Malta, period. If you have a chance, hop on your computer and look up Malta. It is an amazing place. And do you know, over 2,000 years later, they still have a festival, and I believe it's in October this year, the Festival of the Shipwreck, where on the island of Malta, the church celebrates when Paul got wrecked on their island. It's amazing. Go check it out. Uh, I don't know if we'll, we'll ever get there, but it's a great place to go virtually if you want to. Now, let's just observe the conditions because they're anything but nice. What was the weather? Remember? Cold and rain. So what did Paul do? Did he huddle up by the fire? Did he sit down and relax? No. He went on firewood duty. Dripping wet from swimming to shore. He said, you know what? They're, they're starting a fire there. They're going to need more wood. So I think I'm going to go into servant mode. I'm going to serve. There's a need. So I'm going to serve. Let's just consider the opportunity to serve. He followed a family slogan that we try to live by. See the need, meet the need. But it's hard. How often do we see needs and assume someone else would do? How often do we feel the nudge of the Spirit to do something service-oriented and deny it or ignore it? Especially if it seems like a menial task that's beneath us. Paul didn't. And look at his reward. Okay, there could be a whole sermon just in these ten verses. But look at the reward that he immediately got for his service. I don't know how many of you, your personal worst nightmares involve snakes. But mine do. The only comforting part of this is when he flicks the snake back into the fire. Okay? So his, his service was not immediately rewarded with a, attaboy, good job, warm yourself. He was bit. He was bit by a snake. What's going on here? I wonder if Paul ever thought like the Islanders did. Oh my. I thought I was selfish. In fact, I thought I was rescued. Maybe justice did get me. You know, those islanders were right. Paul was a murderer. He oversaw the murder of Stephen, remember? I wonder if Paul, Paul thought, oh man, what was me? No. That's not Paul. That would have been me thinking, but that was not Paul. I believe Paul had in his mind that that serpent was just an impotent symbol of Satan. A shadow of the snake that came in the garden to bite with the venom of, of disappointment and sadness and depression. And I think old Paul said, get away from me, Satan. He just shook him off. He said, you know what? I'm here for a bigger purpose. I'm on a journey. And Mr. Snake, you're not going to hang on me. We must remember, this is the same man who wrote 1 Corinthians, first, 1 Corinthians 15. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? I wonder if he penned that, reflecting on being bitten by the snake in Malta. So he shook himself back into the fire from which it had come out of. Can I ask you today, what do you need to shake off? What do you need to shake off today? What's hanging on your hand, or your heart, or your head? What's hanging on there that's trying to, trying to bite you? Trying to, trying to pull you down, make you sick, divert you from the path that God is trying to keep you on. Perhaps, just for a moment here, I need to pray with you. 
that there be some shaking going on. Let's pray. Lord, for that person who is sitting here today, who actually feels like they were doing good, they were trying to help, but then they got bit. Lord, I pray that they would shake it off and have no ill harm. Because, Lord, we need to see what's next. Thank you, Lord Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Okay. Now they're welcome, yes, at Publius' place. But then he stays in servant mode. Even there, Paul stays in servant mode. And he heals the sick. But also they were entertained and honored. Yes, on Malta for three months. Again, if you go look it up. Malta is a pretty beautiful place. Now I'm going to go in a very different direction. Here I would simply say... God gave Paul a vacation. And I don't think he needs to feel bad about that. I know it's easy to look at the Christian life as go, 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 never stop until you drop because you're doing it for Jesus after all. Well, friends, I think right here on this beautiful little island, God said to Paul, hey, we're going to give you a little time out here. Of course, it took a shipwreck to get you to slow down. It took a shipwreck for you to stop. But now, you know what? You're going to be entertained hospitably. And I'm glad you're here, Paul. What about you? Is it going to take a shipwreck to slow you down, too? Is God whispering through your friends? through your wife, through your kids, maybe through your doctor, that you need to slow down? What would that look like? Maybe it's just a Sabbath rest once a week, like the Ten Commandments say you need. Maybe it's once a week you need to take a rest. Maybe it's a vacation for longer than that or something more. What's God saying to you about your spiritual health and the spiritual rest that you need to take? We're going to keep on reading. And I'm going to have you hop over some sailor stuff. Okay? And we're going to jump right to verses 16 to 22. Verses 16 to 22. you got to move over just a few verses. Verses 16 through 22. When we got to Rome, Paul was allowed to live by himself with a soldier to guard him. Three days later, he called together the leaders of the Jews. When they had assembled, Paul said to them, My brothers, although I have done nothing against our people or against the customs of our ancestors, I was arrested in Jerusalem and handed over to the Romans. They examined me wanted to release him, because I was not guilty of any crime deserving death. But when the Jews objected, I was compelled to appeal to Caesar. Not that I had any charge to bring against my own people. For this reason I have asked to see you and talk with you. It is because of the hope of Israel that I am bound with this chain. They replied, we have not received any letters from Judea concerning you. And none of the brothers who have come from there has reported or said anything bad about you. But we want to hear what your views are, for we know that people everywhere are talking against this sect. Now here's a beautiful testimony of the deep love Paul still has for his people. If anybody had a right to be bitter against the Jews, it was Paul. Let me give you that feeling. Rome is Paul's new home. But he doesn't lose touch with the Jews. Rome is Paul's new home. But he doesn't lose touch with the Jews. Paul grabbed that fact that I think so often we can forget that Jesus was a Jew. He knew that the hope of Israel was Jesus. 
It wasn't necessarily the prophesied hope of Italy or Greece or Malta. The prophecies came to Israel. They should have got it. They should have seen it. The Jews were exactly who could understand and appreciate the gospel the most. And so that was Paul's undying hope. That his people would see Jesus for who he is. Paul's legacy lives on today. How many of you have ever heard of the organization Jews for Jesus? Have you heard of them? How many of you are aware that in our area there are Messianic Jewish temples? These are Jewish people who see Jesus as the Messiah. And they see their primary uh, ministry is to reaching out to other Jews. It's amazing. But what about us? It's so easy to get bitter against people that oppose us and seek to destroy us, perhaps. But our call from Jesus is to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us. It was modeled perfectly, and Paul followed suit. Do we? Paul could have hung with other believers or even other Gentiles but he was drawn back to his people. In the book next door, that is Romans, uh, right next door in the text, you can see it staring at you, but I'll just give you a Romans chapter 10, verse 1. You don't have to go there. Brothers, my heart's desire, this is Paul talking about the Jews. Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. He never gave up. Again, who is your heart's desire for? Who is it that you would love to see saved? Even though they've rejected you. Even though they've rejected your religion. Your invitations to church. Your, your hey, can I pray for you? But you still have a heart's desire for them. Our Sunday School class is studying Walk Across the Room, a video series that gives helps on how to hang in there for the long term. This morning's lesson, talk about a guy who, who was pursued for eight years, just building a relationship. A Christian was building a relationship with a non-Christian. Why? Because he loved him. It's a beautiful testimony. Do you have someone that God has given you a heart's desire to be saved? If you have, don't give up. If you haven't, maybe it's time to pray to God that He would give you a heart's desire for someone in your life who needs to be saved. We're going to finish out with verses 23 to 31. Verses 23 to 31. They arranged to meet Paul on a certain day and came in even larger numbers to the place where he was staying from morning till evening. He explained and declared to them the kingdom of God and tried to convince them about Jesus and saw the law of Moses from the prophets. Some were convinced by what he said, but others would not believe. They disagreed among themselves and began to leave after Paul made this final statement. The Holy Spirit spoke truth your forefathers when he said through Isaiah the prophet, go to this people and say, you will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become callous. They hardly hear with their ears. And they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and I will heal them. Therefore, I want you to know that God's salvation has been sent to the Gentiles, and they will listen. For two whole years, Paul stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him. Boldly and without hindrance, he preached the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ. The great missionary held on by letting go. The great missionary held on by letting go. 
Notice that even the great missionary, even the king convert himself, couldn't convert all of those that he loved. Now, I want you to notice in verse 24, it does say that some were convinced. Some did believe, but not all. But he didn't quit. He held on to the gospel and his mission by letting, him, letting go of those who rejected him. Now folks, let's be real. Nobody likes to be rejected. But Paul's witness illustrates the simple reality that being rejected is often a part of our mission. Until we enter eternity with Jesus, so much of our lives will be balancing that rhythm of holding on and letting go. Of people and of things, of health and of wealth. Again, Paul says it plainly in the book we'll move to next week. And just to get you primed for it, we'll see if you can go there. Philippians. That's where we're going to go next. We're actually going to go to one of Paul's letters that he wrote while he was in Rome. And that's Philippians. I'll give you that little trick. You need to find Philippians. Remember, General Electric Power Company, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. General Electric Power Company. Does that work? It'll help you. It'll help you find because they're little tiny books. But if you can find one of the four, you can usually arrive there. I'm going to have you go to Philippians 4, verse 11. See, you're finding it. Paul, as he talks about being content, him finding that perfect balance of hanging on and letting go. I'm in Philippians 4, verses 11 through 13. I am not saying this because I am in need. For I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content by in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do everything for him who gives me strength. Ooh, I can't wait for Philippians. It's good stuff. This is written by the guy who just, I mean, he came to Rome via a shipwreck. He knows what he's talking about. What is it that God is calling you to hold on to this morning? And what is it that he's calling you to let go? But I'd like us now to focus back on verses 30 and 31. You want to move back to Acts 28. Verses 30 and 31. Because in those verses, I believe we truly see the conquering power of the gospel. The conquering power of the gospel that is proclaimed through Paul and his ministry. Verses 30 and 31. Let me hit you with them just one more time. For two whole years, Paul stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him. Boldly and without hindrance, he preached the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me give you your bonus points. Your bonus points down there. Because I think this capsulizes Paul's entire ministry. And it's really the ministry that continues. Paul's ministry conquered the world and still does today by welcoming all, preaching boldly, Christ's kingdom. Welcoming all, preaching boldly, Christ's kingdom. The gospel message is God's welcome map to the whole world. Those who love Jesus are called to share him with everyone, everywhere, all the time. We do it by preaching. But now don't get nervous. Don't get too nervous. I believe God will give each and every person in this room a pulpit. Now, it may not be as obvious and regular as the one I have. 
as the one that I've been given. That every Sunday about the same time I get up here and preach, you're going to be given a different pulpit. And it's going to be in a different place with a different congregation. But I believe God will give you an opportunity to preach. He will give you an opportunity to preach boldly if you take a shot. If you're willing to submit yourself and say, okay, Lord, I'm willing to speak the words that you have for me. Now, a clear opportunity to share the good news of Jesus with people around you is something that we all need to be conscious and aware of at all times, at school, at work, or wherever. Finally, you need to reach out and preach one kingdom. We welcome all, we preach boldly Christ's kingdom. Paul was immersed in the empire of Rome. He was a Roman citizen who used his rights for protection, even legal process, that actually propelled him to this point. Paul was ultimately a subject of his kingdom. <clears throat> that's who Paul's ultimate allegiance stayed with. Jesus was, and that he was utterly concerned about and committed to. Jesus' kingdom above all else. The Bible gives us few clues Beyond these verses about how, where, or when Paul's life ended, we don't know. Some scholars think that he was released after two years and went to Spain and then was jailed again and brought back. Others believe he was executed by Nero. But Paul himself gives us the only words we need to know about his life and his death. Again, it comes from our next series. We'll begin next week. You don't need to go there. It's Philippians 121 where Paul says, For me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Welcoming all, preaching boldly Christ's kingdom. Here are the conquering tactics that Paul dedicated his life to. And we are called to the same, even today. Let us pray. Oh Lord, I thank you for Paul's witness. Lord, he was a guy who was so opposed to you, but then made such an incredible impact for you. Oh, to imagine those of us who didn't start out opposed. Those of us who have known you for a long time. Oh, Lord, what an impact we could make. Would you help us to see the pulpits that you have for us to preach boldly from? Would you help us to welcome all who seek to know you through us. And would you see, would you help us to seek to be committed to your kingdom alone? Above all else. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.